Welcome to this opening Eucharist of the 144th Convention of the Diocese of Fond du Lac. Catherine of Siena was one of the great teachers, mystics, and saints of the church. She lived in the 14th century in Italy. Catherine grew up during a time of political, economic, and social upheaval. She lived in the wake of the Great Plague, the Black Death, during which 50 to 60, maybe even 75 percent of the people died in Siena over the summer of 1348. It was also a time of religious upheaval and uncertainty. But in spite of that context, Catherine of Siena was able to confidently affirm her experience of the abiding love of God. She wrote this prayer. And you, high eternal trinity, acted as if you were drunk with love, infatuated with your create creature. When you saw this tree could bear no fruit but the fruit of death, because it was cut off from you who are life, you came to its rescue with the same love with which you had created it. You engrafted your divinity into the dead tree of our humanity. Oh, sweet, tender engrafting, you, sweetness itself, stooped to join yourself with our bitterness. You stooped to join yourself with our bitterness. Catherine of Siena knew that in the person of Jesus Christ, God has come to abide with us and in us. In spite of our sinful, broken selfishness, our unlove, our misdirected fears and desires, Jesus abides with us and in us. And he invites us to abide in him so we can bear a different kind of fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of love. That is good news. We need to hear that good news today. I need to hear it. Our time is not quite as bad as was Catherine of Siena's. Still, things are hard. Everywhere I go, people seem harassed and frazzled by life. Do you feel that? Frazzled and harassed by life. Lots of things are changing, some beyond anyone's control, others within our control if we only had the will. In any event, those changes leave us with a sense of loss and grief. People are tired. Many are lonely and isolated. Our politics and society at large are more polarized than they have been for a long time. Our public rhetoric is mean, petty, and even violent. It all takes a toll. We need good news. And those, who, those of us who care about the church also long for good news. Reports of abuse and neglect and schism in the broader of church are a scandal and discouraging. There is an intensification of secularism and individualism. Increasingly, people are disinclined to join or commit to anything, let alone the church. And for those reasons and others, attendance and finances are down. Things are changing. There is a sense of loss and grief. It can be hard not to worry about the future. I know that I am tempted to wallow in overwhelming worry. 
There's so much going on in the world that troubles, troubles me, and so little I can actually do about much of it. Declining attendance and budgets in the church also trouble me. I can only say that when I'm able to stay close to Jesus, when I abide in the one who stooped to join himself with our bitterness, then I know a different kind of peace. I'm able to do what I can to engage things with a different kind of patience and hope. But it's hard, isn't it? So many other things distract us. So many other things demand our time and attention. It can be hard to remember who came to abide with us to bring his love and joy and peace. And it can be easy for us to not turn to him and abide in him. But in the midst of all that troubles us, distracts us, and saps our energy, Jesus calls us to abide in him as he already abides in us. Abide in me. He knows all that tempts us to be anxious and angry, weary and wary. Still, he says, abide in me as I abide in you. It is there that we find our consolation. It is there that I have found my consolation. I hope you have experienced some of that consolation. Do you yearn to experience more? I do. And with this morning's gospel, I want to encourage us all to abide, to abide in Jesus. He promises that if we do so, our lives will become more fruitful, bearing the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generos generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are fruit we all desire. That is fruit that the world needs. Jesus promises that those who abide in him will know abundant life and fullness of joy. In my first convention address four years ago right here, I suggested that Christians are in the joy business. Not a superficial happiness, but a deep joy that trans transcends our circumstances because we are Easter people. As Easter people, we live by hope and seek to be a people of God's mercy and delight for a world where mercy and delight are in short supply, a world where love is in short supply. And most especially, abiding in Jesus, we experience his love. His love fills us, and that love brings healing, forgiveness, and transformation. And it enables us to love with his love. If you were at the banquet last night, you saw the video of our presiding Bishop Michael Curry introduce the way of love. I've been talking it up in the churches I visit since General Convention earlier in the summer. It is a sort of rule of life similar, similar to the one that I encouraged members of the diocese to adopt a few gener uh, uh, conventions ago. You've got it in your uh, bulletin in the insert. I encourage you to take it out. I'm not going to go through all of it, but take it out for just a moment. Here are the practices Bishop Curry commends to us, and I encourage us to embrace. Turn, learn, pray, 
worship, bless, go, rest. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to take these to heart. I intend to. They are the classic means by which we abide in Jesus and go deeper into his love, his mercy, and his delight. The one practice Bishop Curry does not include that I included was fasting. You can be thankful, I guess, for that. Although I think it is still a good spiritual discipline, and I'm going to continue to practice it, especially on Wednesdays. But he has all the others that I suggested, plus some. And I want us in the coming years to focus on these seven practices. I promise you this. If you spend more time doing these seven things and less time watching cable news, listening to talk radio, or obsessing online about the latest outrage, you will experience more peace and more hope. And probably more energy. Some of our congregations have already begun to study the way of love and begun to put them into practice. And I encourage all of the congregations and each member to do so. Talk about them with one another. Share your experiences with those seven things. Encourage one another, exhort one another, challenge one another to live into these practices. You'll be hearing more about the way of love going forward for the next, well, as long as I'm the bishop, you'll be hearing about them. Along with the way of love, I want to uh, mention one other thing that we're going to be beginning here in the diocese that I think will help us to abide more fully and live more deeply into the life of Christ. Next year, we're going to begin offering a program called Faithful Innovation. This is a program developed by Dwight Shiley, who spoke at our spring conference last April. If you were there, you know how good he is and how good his material is. Some of our congregations have been studying his book, Agile Church, since he was here. And that's another thing I encourage you to do. And you'll be hearing more about faithful innovation this afternoon. But I want basically to tell you a bit about it. Mostly, or basically, faithful innovation builds on the good work the Commission on Congregational Vitality has been doing. And let me just say this. I've been pleased as I've gone around the diocese with how congregations have been responding to the work of the CCV and discerning amongst themselves new ways to engage with God, to engage with one another, and to engage the world, and I encourage you to continue to do so. But in the program, Faithful Innovation, which I hope eventually every congregation will take part in, we will practice listening, listening for the Holy Spirit's guidance in three areas. One is scripture. By dwelling in the word or abiding in the word, we will practice listening more closely for the Holy Spirit's wisdom and guidance. Second is listening to one another. Abiding with one another, we'll practice a deeper listening to one another's stories and the stories of their lives. And third is the world around us. We will dwell in the word. We will also dwell in the world. We will seek to abide with those with whom Jesus already abides and listen for the places where there is hurt and need that we might seek to pray for and address. We will also practice abiding with our neighbors, listening and looking for what Jesus might already be up to among our neighbors and find ways to join them in that work. Overall, it is a patient, non-anxious 
relaxing into what the Spirit is calling us to be. A way for us to abide more deeply in Jesus. We live in anxious times, angry times. People are frazzled, frantic, wary, and weary. I am often frazzled, frantic, wary, and weary. It seems just about everyone is on edge. It can feel overwhelming, distracting, and disorienting. But we are Easter people. We are people of hope. We are people who know that Jesus abides with us. Jesus, who is sweetness itself, as Catherine of Siena said. He has stooped to join himself with us in our bitterness and in our joy. He abides in us. And if we abide in him, if we practice his way of love, we will know the fruit of the Spirit, and we will experience his love and joy and peace, and we will become a people of God's mercy and delight, and we will be ourselves good news to a world that is desperate and hungry and yearning for the good news we have in Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters of the Diocese of Fond du Lac, the Holy Spirit is not done with us yet. The Holy Spirit is not done with the church. And the Holy Spirit and Christ call us to abide, to rest in that good news, and then be that good news to the world around us.